Hiya. Um, well, you're all up bright and early, aren't you? So after the speaker's dinner and the drinks last night. Um, my name's Cliff Davies. I'm here to talk to you about um, .NET on uh, Meadow, um, which are tiny little boards, just like this. And they're gonna run full .NET, and I'm gonna show you how we do that. Um, I don't work for Meadow. I don't work for Microsoft. Um, no involvement with the company whatsoever. I'm just a freelance .NET, IoT, and uh, Maui developer. So I backed it as a Kickstarter. Um, it's an awesome project and I use them in client projects because they're, they're so goddamn good. Um, and I can write .NET uh, in C-sharp and make it work where I need it to work. So I'm gonna to talk to you a bit about IoT. How many people here are IoT developers? Nobody. I've got one little hand over there waving at me. Um, are you all .NET developers at least? Yeah, lots of nods, excellent. Um, so I'm gonna show you how you can take your existing skills that you have right now and use your favorite libraries and make them work to control the world or take feed, uh, feedback and sensor data from the world. Um, I'm Microsoft MVP in developer technologies and IoT as well, so I've got two kind of hats that I wear there. Um, but let's start out then, because you're not IoT developers, my clicker's decided not to work. I'm really having that bad luck with clickers and tech this morning, so we'll use the space, shall we? No. There we go. Is that working now? Yeah, there you go. Um, so Internet of Things then, or IoT, um, is basically stuff that's connected to the internet. So, you know, be that your washing machine, your, your uh, Nest uh, system that's controlling the heating in your home, um, your electric car if you've got one, um, your fridge freezer to tell you that there's no milk in the fridge. Um, all these sorts of things are all connected to the internet to feed data up. And Statistica um, put out this chart every year and they put it out literally a, a week or so ago. And we can see there, you know, why bother with IoT? In 2024, there's 17 billion IoT devices on the planet. So it's more than two per person on the planet. And you think there's a lot of people that you know, don't have electricity, let alone plug in an IoT device. Um, that doesn't include mobile phones. If you want to include mobile phones, you add about another 10 billion, which means that there's more than a, a mobile phone for every person on the planet as well. I'm sure most of us have probably got one or two sitting around. Um, but these are active daily connections as well. So there's quite a lot of IoT devices out there measuring the world and providing feedback and kind of uh, information to, to businesses that are using that information to produce the next uh, product that they're making. So that's why we bother. Um, it's a growing industry, over $3 trillion um, in, uh, in 2023. So it's, it's growing quite quickly and it's kind of, you know, it looks like exponential at the moment, but obviously it'll plateau at some point. Um, so that's why we want to bother. But obviously, elephant in the room is the fact that we all know IoT devices. Um, there's an awesome um, uh, Twitter X, whatever you want to call it this week, um, handle called Internet of Shit. And every kind of few days you post pictures and, and, and tech memes around things that have been found. Just do my hair for the picture. Um, that have been found around the, uh, the world, which are internet devices, which haven't quite worked. Um, Nike here, um, obviously from uh, Back to the Future, they wanted to have those laces that Marty McFly put on, put on his boots and they laced themselves up. So they produced them um, and said, yep, we finally made it to the future. This is the future, but it didn't work because the API didn't work. And the electronics that were in the, uh, in the sole of the, um, of the, uh, the shoe uh, were damaged um, when you started to run and things like this. So um, yeah, they're, they're, they're Shoes are no longer on sale. Uh, here we've got Google Clouds. Um, so this, was, uh, this was streams around the world. Uh, you can see up the top left there, um, you can see a mobile phone that connects to uh, the Google Cloud infrastructure. All the bits from Redis, there's some, uh, some Datadog in there, there's some AI in there, there's data stores and cloud and storage and all sorts. All that to talk to a bridge, to talk via Zigbee, to turn on a light switch or turn on a light bulb. So this is like the kind of, you know, all the stuff that we kind of, you know, tech people like to put into our projects, but it's just to turn on a light switch when you can just walk over and turn it on. Yeah, you can shout from the bed, yeah, turn on the lights, turn off the lights, um, Alexa or whatever. But um, that's all that was, uh, was for. It just made me giggle that all that infrastructure just turned on the light switch. This one really did make me giggle. This is a few weeks ago, uh, a selfie bottle. Um, so Coca-Cola decided that they, they'll put a camera in the bottom of the bottle and as you tip it up, it'll take a selfie and put it to your Instagram feed. Why? 
Just why? You can imagine the meetings and the excitement and everything else in the, uh, in the office there. I wouldn't mind, but if you look at the picture on the bottom left, it's a pretty grainy, horrible picture as well. It gets posted, so... Um, yeah, but I don't know how many of these are in the world, but they're out there, um, part of that 17 billion devices. Um, your tumble dryer at home, your clothes dryer um, is reporting if you connect to the internet. My one at home does connect to the internet. I've not connected it because I really don't see the point. Um, but it's going to tell me if I did connect it that, um, you know, what am I missing out on the drying cycles? Which one should I use? I just want to put my wet clothes in and get dry clothes out. It's pretty simple. Um, just go with it. Um, this one cracks me up as Microsoft MPB. I, I probably shouldn't sort of uh, bitch and moan about Azure IoT Hub, um, but this was a sign that was on the toilet door, and it logs the data. Don't know what data it's logging, but it's logging the usage. Um, if you don't want your data to be logged when you go to the toilet, you can read the uh, second bottom line. There. Do not turn the lock all the way. So don't lock the door, and we won't log your data. But if you do lock the door, you'll hear a lightsaber. And that's like kind of Darth Vader coming to get you. So you really will kind of crap yourself. Um, so, but again, these are things that people are thinking to use IoT for. Um, I point it out because whenever I do talks, people always say, yeah, but IoT, it's just a gimmick. I've got it at home. I've got it turned on the lights. I've got it turned on the, the sprinkler in the garden. And you kind of use it for a bit of home automation. You get bored, you walk away. I want to kind of dispel that, take it away, and make you think about what you can use it for in your line of business, what you can take to your boss on Monday morning and say, look, I've seen this cool tech, and I think we can use it to do X, Y, Z. Um, that's what I want this talk to be about. So let's go back to the internet of things and talk about the, the, the things that we could possibly do with it. Smart cities, you know, controlling the uh, environmental or, or measuring the environment uh, around the city, how much NOx emissions around, how many cars are coming into the city, all this sort of stuff. Smart buildings, I've recently just worked on a project where we, we measured uh, or looked at the floor plate and if there was not many people around, we turned the H3 down. So we turned the air conditioning down, uh, not the temperature, but just the flow rate to save electricity. We did hot desking, so we had thermal sensors around the floor plate in the ceiling tiles that measured how many people on the floor plate and which areas weren't busy. So then we could put it onto a map as you walked onto the floor to show where all the empty desks were. So instead of you walking in and wandering around with your bag looking for an empty desk to sit down on today, you could walk in, look at the chart, so there's a bunch of green desks over there, I'll go over there and sit there. Um, security and surveillance, so monitoring stuff. Um, I've got one of these sitting in a... Uh, in a um, in a hangar um, monitoring um, some equipment on a farmer's field, um, which is just there just for a bit of security. But they can't put normal cameras in there because there's no internet. So we've got one of these sitting there that's got a 5G uh, antenna and reports up to the cloud and sends a picture every few minutes uh, up to the cloud. Um, so, you know, there's real use cases that can be used for. Retail, you, you're starting to see now um, little um, uh, uh, e-read ink, scre e -ink screens instead of prices along the, 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 the shelf front um, and also the interactive advertising. So they see you come into the store and they know that you like to, you know, you're you know, a white guy and you want to buy this. So we're going to put the advertising as you walk down the aisle that's going to be targeted at you. Um, you know, so all that sort of stuff is, is coming around. Healthcare, you know, is all your monitors and sensors and heart rate monitors, etc., cetera, um, including things like watches and things. Um, so there's lots of use cases, and I'm sure if you sat down over a cup of coffee, you could probably think of use cases within your business and in your vertical that you work in. The problem with IoT, though, and the bit that scares most people off, is the fact that it can be complex. Yeah. You look at this, and it's you know, a small little board, but then you think to yourself, well, I've got to get an engineer to design that. I've got to get an engineer to like, build it and work out all the tooling. I've then got to get a factory to manufacture it in a, in a fab. Um, it's hard to scale. If I mess up the design, I can't just do a quick you know, find and replace. I've got to go and change all the hardware, remanufacture, refab it. Um, and it's difficult to customise. If we want to customise it, I've then got to go back to the beginning again and start. And that is hardware design. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It is hard. Um, but there are companies out there, or you take devices that are built like these, uh, and Raspberry Pis and the likes, and you build something yourself to get a prototype that works. And when you have it built and working, you take your breadboard um, with all your wires, um, and it looks like a homemade uh, device, and you take it along to a hardware company and say, right, make that into a board that works for me and, and does what I need it to do. 
But at long lead times, companies tend to get, uh, when I've worked on projects, they tend to get partway through the project and then they, they run out of, uh, of funding or they don't think it's going to work because they don't expect the design bit to take so long. So the quicker you can get to a working prototype, uh, the better for your company. The other bit that scares a lot of people is they think, well, I've got to do some soldering. And uh, you probably last did that if you're not into IoT. You probably last did it when you were at school and you burnt your fingers or you burnt your friend's clothes and, uh, and stuff like this. Um, as someone who does a lot of soldering, uh, this picture just made me giggle because you can see all the dry joints and all the, the really bad soldering attempts uh, on the board there. Um, so that's why I picked it out because I, just, I was like, that's never going to work. Um, not at all. Um, but this scares a lot of people, which is why you can use things like breadboards. Um, these little white boards here, the lines are all uh, uh, connected in certain directions. You can go on the internet and Google it, but, um, and then you can use those to prototype out your work and get it all working with just some push pin wires. You don't need to solder. Um, you can wait until you've got a prototype working, hand it to the hardware engineer and get them to build it for you. But let's talk about the actual processor. Let's talk about these little chips that are inside. We often don't see these when we're working on our laptop or our desktop. Um, but a microcontroller, you can read that quicker than I can say it, um, but a microcontroller basically is the CPU. If you think about your computer, your von Neumann system that's in your computer that you've got um, when you're working, you've got your CPU, you've got your graphics cards, you've got some input outputs, um, be it USB, etc., and you've also got some memory. So that is what a microcontroller is. It's all that in one chip. So it's just a system on a chip. And a lot of the uh, IoT boards that you see around now are basically taking chips like this one, an STM chip, is out of an old Android phone from 10, 15 years ago because they're so cheap now. Um, so they're taking those chips and they're putting them onto boards. So we've got a chip that was running an Android phone, like a G1, G2, something from 10, 15 years ago. And we can now use it and buy it for literally not many, uh, not many dollars and use it to run our uh, devices. But when I started out as IoT back in college, um, we were using AVRs and PIC16s. Does anyone use these? Few hands, yeah. So that's why you don't do IoT anymore, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but you, uh, I've still got some projects where it's some AVR uh, microcontrollers that I support with a client, and um, every time I have to get out the uh, the AVR software, I sort of cry a little inside. Um, but you can see here, um, you've got an imp void main. Okay, I can understand what that does. Yeah. And then you've got a, a DDRA data direction register A, data direction register B, which is setting up the two registers. And then you've got port B, and we're turning on all the LEDs, and then we've got a while loop, because obviously when you get to the end of the program, the board doesn't know what to do. It's not like it's got an OS, it just turns off. Um, and then we're setting that, uh, that pin. So when you push a switch, an LED comes on. It's quite complex. Yeah, I've explained it to you, but if you went more than a button to turn on an LED, it would get very complex very quickly. So these were great, but it was hard work. You needed to know C. Um, you need to be you know, embedded systems engineer and know the fact you can't just connect the LED to the pin, you needed a resistor to, to take the load as well. Um, and you need to know how to calculate the size of the resistor to give the right current rating through the LED, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to be a bit of a hardware engineer, um, which isn't what you know, we want you to be able to do. So then in 2005, Arduino, has anyone used these? Yeah, more hands, great. You've, it, you've got internet of things in your home, so you've uh, connected up the, the sprinkler and the lights. Um, these were 2005. They took the AVR chips that were at the bottom of the previous page there and put them onto boards. And the idea was that they were going to be used for teaching students in college and, uh, and to teach them how to be a hardware engineer. But actually, it turned out that actually a lot of people enjoyed playing with them because it made it a lot simpler. You had headers um, that you can push the cables onto. And uh, with that, you um, uh, could write a version of C that wasn't at DDRA. It was Arduino C, which was they abstracted some of the hard parts away and made it easier for you to do. You can also do it now with Python. So that's why these boards have now gone into mainstream schools. Certainly in the UK, some schools have got it. My son's school have got a few um, Arduino um, Leonardo boards uh, in their lab that they use for, for literally pushing the button, turn on the LED, but the kids love it. Um, making things flash. Um, similar time frame, we had Ada Fruits, Lady Ada, she's an MIT engineer, um, and she brought out these boards, they're called Feathers. Um, they're literally the same, same size as, uh, as these, and there's a whole host of, of stuff. Um, that runs again, Arduino C, 
Python, CircuitPython, um, and then on the other side, you've got Paul Stossum's um, PRJC, uh, which is a play on the same things, but using slightly more powerful chips. I use lots of those on projects because they're dirt cheap, really powerful, 600 megahertz processors. Um, I think there's a, they've got the, yeah, the slightly bigger one there, 180 megahertz Core M4 processor. So they're quite powerful chips. Um, that we can use in our projects. And they're like literally 20 bucks. Um, you can get from Amazon if you really wanted to. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we can use. So how does that work then? That same program we had before in Arduino C, we have a setup which runs once at the beginning and it sets pin 13 to an output pin. And then we just turn it high, wait a second, turn it low, wait a second. That's a little closer to .NET, isn't it? We can understand that. But as soon as you go away from doing things like this, it gets complex again because you know you're down into C. Um, if we want to run, um, this is literally code that is sitting running a NeoPixel string of LEDs around my kitchen um, at home. Uh, you can see there, it's, a lot of it is, is comments granted, but you can see there it's getting quite complex. I've got a trinket running it because I just wanted something small and tucked away and glued up inside the cabinet. So you can see there, um, I've got define and then I'm setting the clock pre-cycle. So I'm having to start thinking a bit like a hardware engineer again um, to, to get things to work. If you do do Arduino though, a lot of people use the Arduino IDE. Who uses that? Uh, not many people. Yeah, it, it's horrible, isn't it? Um, you can't even do, it's got no IntelliSense, it's got nothing there. It's literally notepad with a couple of extra buttons. Um, I personally, I use Visual Micro, which is a plugin for Visual Studio. And that means you can use Visual Studio and all the power of Visual Studio, all the IntelliSense, CodePilot, because why not, um, and, and run and work on your, um, on your uh, Arduino projects um, within, the, uh, within your environment. But like I said, we're all .NET developers, yeah? We all want to wear the, the Superman C-sharp badge, yeah, and rock around and say, I know what I'm doing. Um, and then this guy stood up on stage back in 2021 and said, .NET runs everywhere, um, but does it really? At the time, he was playing with a Raspberry Pi um, rather than much smaller devices. Who's used a Raspberry Pi? Yeah, lots of people. They're great, aren't they? They're fantastic. Um, but it's running Linux, so it's got an OS. So it's basically a computer from 10, 15 years ago. They're using a Broadcom chip that was out of a, uh, out of a mobile phone. 10, 15 years ago. And that's how they keep the price down to $35 um, is they keep kind of going to the next kind of iteration of mobile phone chip that's available, that's cheap. Um, shot to the Pi 5 now, isn't it? Yeah. Um, if you want to run .NET on it, my um, good friend Pete Gallagher has got a, uh, a, a single line script there on his, uh, on his website, on his blog. And you literally put that one in and it will go out to GitHub and it will pull everything down and install .NET running on your Raspberry and system. Um, but you need three amps to run it. So three amps is a lot of power. I talked about putting one of these in a hangar on a farmer's field to monitor equipment. There's no power out there. There's no electricity. You can't really run it from a solar cell because that's not gonna work because you're not gonna get three amps from a solar cell unless it's a whacking great big solar farm, which kind of you know, defeats the object. <laughs> Um, so it is good, you can use it, you can run .NET, and it is full .NET, um, and you can get that to work on your device. So how do we get our LED to work on there? This is now, we're back into .NET, and it's just a console app, so we can all write a console app in .NET, and we set up a GPIO controller, GPIO is general purpose input output, so that is how we turn a pin on and off, etc. Um, and then we, we set how long we want it to light for, 300 milliseconds, and we go through our while loop and we turn the, light, the pin on and off, on and off. Much the same, but it's now .NET. So we're a little bit more kind of warm and fuzzy inside. We, we feel a bit better about uh, what we're doing. So we compare that to what we had in Arduino C. It's a bit longer, granted, but it's now .NET that we know. And the advantage of using .NET is we can then go out to NuGet and pull down our, our packages. If you want to do something with the cryptographic library, we can go and do that. Um, you know, we can write tests against it because we all want to have tests um, and make sure we get all the green ticks. So we can do that. But again, this is a powerful board running Linux OS. So now, how do you update the Linux OS? I was chatting to someone at breakfast this morning that was talking about using these and, in a project, and they could update their, do over their updates of their software 
but the Linux, they had to go out to site and literally plug a computer in, update the Linux, um, because it can't be done over the air. There is ways of doing it, um, but it's, it's a bit messy. Um, so you don't really want to deal with that. You just want your code to run and do your thing. You don't need to worry about the board, the OS, etc. So the two options we've got for running C Sharp and .NET are the Wilderness Labs Meadow Ball, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and the other one which is really exciting is Nano Framework. Uh, has anyone heard of Nano Framework? Yeah, there's a couple of hands kicking around. Um, Nano Framework is, uh, is a um, .NET Foundation project where they take .NET and what they've done is they put a, a wrapper around the .NET. So when you do um, uh, write some code like you know, debug.write line, um, they've got a, a bit of code that takes your C Sharp and turns it into something the board understands. And then they can target an ESP32, an STM chip, uh, 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 Texas Instruments, so they can target different boards and chips, which then means that you can then buy boards from anywhere, you don't need to worry about them too much. Downside is it's not full .NET, um, so you can't do your, your, your dictionaries and this, like all your generics. They haven't quite, they've been working at it for about a year now, um, they haven't quite got to kind of wrap in everything just yet, so it's not full .NET. Wilderness Labs though is and we'll talk about how they uh, work. But first, this introduction to the board. I've shown it a few times here. Um, it's literally um, three inches long by just under an inch uh, wide. Um, so 75 mil by sort of uh, 25 mil um, is the main dev board. And then you've got the compute module. And the idea behind the compute module is when you've developed your board on a breadboard and you've got your circuit working, you can then use a compute module. You just drop that into your board that you've had designed by a hardware engineer that does your full project. Um, or you can just stay with a breadboard. I've got many of these kicking around in client projects in a plastic box that's taped up and screwed down. And you can't see what's in there, but if you used to open it, it looked like a bunch of wires. Um, but that's all the client wanted. Uh, how does that compare to the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi? We can see um, this is one of uh, Wilderness Labs' slides. Um, so you can see they've put all the ticks on all the things, but there's other things that Raspberry Pi and Arduino could do that the, the Wilderness Labs can't. Um, but we can do over the air updates, uh, it can support graphic displays, um, low energy, so you can run it from a battery to the point where if you look at that white uh, GST plug, that is where you plug a battery in and then you can plug uh, solar in as well so you can charge your battery during the day, um, which is what happens on this farmer's field. Um, it charges the battery and then during the night the battery is powering the system. Um, you know, it runs full .NET standards. They're working on getting it across to .NET 6 and the reason they're targeting 6 is because that's where they started to work on a, a year or two ago and then they'll, once they get there they'll be able to step 7, 8 and probably 9 by the time they get it finished. The Meadow boards, uh, it's got an STM32 chip, um, so it's a 32-bit 32 uh, 32, uh, chip. Um, it's got more than 32 mega flash now, um, it's now 64. Uh, it's got an ESP32 on the end, it does the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, but ha acts as a coprocessor. So if you want to do it over the updates, it pushes the code down to the memory, then the ESP32 takes over the main processor and installs the software and updates and OS updates. So you can do it all without actually going to sites. All you just need is a connection to the device. Um, so you can do all that uh, from, uh, from comfort of a warm office rather than a dirty, muddy farmer's field with all the cows mooing around you. How does it work though on the boards? Um, the OS is at the bottom. We've got a micro RTOS, which is a, a real-time operating system. That's the actual, that's your OS effectively. And that's running it all. And then sitting on top is Mono. The team behind this were all from Xamarin. Um, so they're used to using Mono to get .NET to run on mobile phones. Um, and like I said, and I've said a few times now, the chips in these are the ones out of early mobile phones. So they knew that it works because they've done it. So they've got the Mono runtime, which now means we've got Mono.NET running on our board. On top of that, you've got .NET Standard 2, um, and they've, they've, they maintain that at the moment, but uh, as I say, they're hoping to get up to the .NET 6, 7, 8, 9. Uh, have a security layer above that to secure the board and the chip, so once the, the, the software is on the board, um, you can't pull things off the coprocessor, so if you want to put something securely on the board, you put it into the ESP32, and there it lives, and you can't pull stuff from it, but if you put stuff in, on the main memory, it can be pulled down and looked at, and I'll show you how to do that in a wee while. 
So you've got Meadow Core, think of that as your base class library. That's your normal kind of uh, bits that actually you need, like how to connect to a pin, how to um, uh, talk to the network, uh, Bluetooth, graphics, etc. And then above that is a Meadow Foundation, which is all their NuGets. And it is literally all on NuGet. So you go out to NuGet, there's over 200 of these. Last time I looked was a few months ago, um, that you can go out to um, uh, uh, NuGet and pull down. So if you're using like a GPS sensor, um, you can pull down the NuGet for the GPS sensor and make that work. And the reason you don't want to pull down the whole of the internet is because obviously you've only got a small memory footprint and if you don't need it, why install it? Um, so what you don't use is linked out um, to make sure that you know, only what is required is loaded onto the board as well. So if we look at this a little bit deeper, you've got the Nutex uh, real-time operating system um, at the bottom. Above that, we've got our, our, um, our runtime, which is doing all the sleep APIs. So if you want to put it to sleep because you're only taking a picture every two minutes, for example, you can put it to sleep and save the battery. Um, you know, all the crash reporting, health monitoring, battery controllers, et cetera. Above that, we've got our analog port. We can connect to that. And then above that, we've got a Meadow Foundation, we've got an air quality sensor, a BME 680, which is measuring the, the quality of the air. So you can see the different layers that stack on top um, to get us to, uh, to where we want to be. The other thing they've got as well is they've got a Project Labs board. Now, these have been around for, what, nearly two years now. Um, they're up to version three. And a Project Labs board means you can take your, your bog standard um, Meadow F7 and plug it into a board, which has got some sensors on it. It's got some uh, BME sensors for doing pressure, temperature, and humidity. It's got a IMU sensor, which means you can move it around and, and see if it's being moved. Um, it's got a light sensor on there, it's got a sound sensor, it's got a few sensors on it just to get you started because they're the, typically the sensors that we use when we work on an IoT project. Um, you've got the microbus on the left which means you can plug boards in from, from the microbus system um, and on the right hand side you've got the Grove system uh, which is from kind of Arduino and, uh, and the likes and then you've got a, a Stemma uh, Quick QT which is a serial bus which you can use to plug uh, boards into, that's out of Adafruit. Um, you've got an RS-485 port at the bottom, so if you're connecting to something that's using Modbus, which is used a lot in, uh, in industry, um, then you can, uh, you can plug in your, your Modbus controllers and control them as well. You've got a screen, a TFT screen. The new one, the Model 3, has got a massive, great big screen. Um, but it means you can plug stuff in, get it working, prototype it, and all the screw terminals are plug in. So you, you don't need to get that soldering iron out and practice the soldering skills from junior school. Um, you can just crack on and build your project. So that means that we don't need to go out and buy a BME 280. Now, whenever I go and watch IoT projects and you see someone stand on stage or do it on the internet, they always go and get a BME 280 and they plug it in and they show you the temperature of the room, which I find boring. And it's like, well, why are we doing that? All we're doing is showing that we can measure the temperature of the room. That's not really exciting. So I'm not going to use one of those. Um, I'm going to use some other bits that I've got here and if I can get my robot to work, we'll have a moving robot. So if we go out and do some demos, oh. uh, that one there. So what we've got here, you should be able to see this which is my Occhio cam here. So this here is the Project Labs board and I've loaded software onto that and I'm not sure you can see it, but on the screen it's showing the... It's not really coming out. I think it's all these lights here. But you can see, basically, it's all the temperature and um, the weather here in London. So at the moment in London, it's uh, five degrees outside, 86% uh, humidity, and uh, it feels like one degree, so it feels a lot colder out there. Um, but you can just about make that out. So that's connecting to the internet, uh, connecting to an open uh, weather API and pulling down the data. So you can see there, we're connecting to the internet and, and doing some stuff. So if we go and look at the code, if we go into, um, you know what, rather than do this, let's start at the very, very beginning, which is what I should be doing. It's because that wasn't working earlier and I got excited that the fact that it is working now and it's connected and all it needed was me to just wait a little longer and I was, I was prepared to wait. So if we go into Visual Studio and start at the beginning. 
So we've got Visual Studio, we want to create a new project. And I've got a board here, it's got nothing on it. Um, and then we, you can see I do a lot of IoT stuff, because it's stuck on it. And we put in Meadow. You can see here we've got our Meadow board uh, application and we can do it in C Sharp, F Sharp, and come on, there's always someone who does Visual Basic still. <laughs> there's always someone. Um, if you are that person, you can still write your code to run on IoT. Now, how cool is that? Um, no, come on. Um, and then you've got the core compute module, which is that little board that I showed you earlier. So you can target those as well. And then you've got a library if you want to write your own library for some new sensor that they haven't quite um, targeted yet. Um, I've worked with a team and I know of a company that went to them and said, look, we need to use this sensor, but we don't have the skills internally. So the Meadow team actually wrote the driver for that sensor and is now in the Meadow Foundation um, to use. So we're going to do it in C Sharp because that's what I know. Um, and do that. When you change, you do speaking, they get you to change it in 1920 by 1080. All your buttons move, don't they? And it's really horrible. Um, so I'm just going to call it Meadow 3 and we'll connect and we'll connect there. So you'll see here in our um, thing here, we've got our dependencies, which is all our packages that we have. So you've got the Meadow Foundation, the Meadow F7. Um, frameworks, .NET standards that we talked about earlier, um, and then you've got analyzers if you're using any analyzers. You can see here we're doing source generation system.text.json. You wouldn't expect it to see that on uh, uh, an IoT board, but it's there. Uh, it's been source generated for us. Uh, we've got Wi Fi config, uh, Meadow config, and app config. So if we look at the Wi Fi config, um, this is just where you put your SSID and your password in. Um, it's all in YAML, uh, yet another markup language. Um, and these uh, config files are what get loaded onto the coprocessor, that ESP32 we talked about earlier. And once they're loaded, the files are destroyed, so they don't live on the board. So once it's loaded into memory, the file is destroyed, which is part of the security layer that they have there as well. Um, in the Meadow config, we can give our board a name, um, which is how it will appear on the network. Uh, we can um, tell it if there's an SD storage. So if we need more than 64 meg, we can put an SD card in there. Um, and then we can do things like setting up the network automatically. So as soon as it gets power, it connects to the network. We can give it a, uh, a gateway. Um, we can set up um, where it's going to get the, a timestamp from the internet and where it's going to look for the DNS servers if you want to control it uh, ultimately um, the way you need to. In the uh, app config here, we can get it to restart on failure. Now there's no OS. Really, you've got the Nutex um, OS at the base. Um, but if your board hits a, uh, uh, an exception uh, in C Sharp, and what's it going to do? It's going to crash. It's not going to crash to an OS because there isn't one for it to crash to. So what you do uh, typically in an IoT project is you get it to restart. So if there's an exception, you say, right, we'll turn off, count to five, and turn back on again. And hopefully, fingers crossed, um, things will work again. Um, so what you do here is you can get it to restart on failure. Um, and then you can give it a delay. Um, typically, 15 seconds is a good uh, timer. I tend to put my up to around 30. Um, and that is a watchdog timer. And what happens is, in memory, it adds this tag in. And when it's going around a big loop, it resets the timer um, at the top of the loop. So if you're, you get stuck in a long-running task in the middle of your loop, in your initialize or your run loop, um, it will say, well, that timer's run out, therefore I'm going to kill the, kill the app, restart the board, and hopefully next time it won't be a long-running task. So you have to just be aware of that when you're programming. Um, it's not like you've got this big server machine, the Azure or AWS cloud, sitting there doing all your work for you. You've got a small little processor that's doing the work. So you can set those up. You can set up your login to trace it out to, to, uh, to the SD card, etc. But if we go into our Meadow, um, uh, the main Meadow app here, which is our start of our project, uh, we can see here we've got the app and Meadow V2. I've got a V1 board here, so I'm going to change that to V1. And um, in there also is where you'd put compute module if you're using that. Uh, initialize runs at the beginning, and that initializes the board. So we log out to the resolver, which goes out to um, Visual Studio here. We're setting up the onboard um, LED, uh, and then we return from that. The run command just says that we're running, and we're cycling the colors every second, and then 
we call into this, and look at this, we've got things like async task. It's normal.net. So the stuff that you're used to writing day in, day out is, is right there. Um, and then we await uh, show color pulse, we set the color, set the duration, and, and then we go down there. So it's a bit more complex than just turning on LED, which we looked at earlier, but this is just .NET. It runs and works just like normal .NET. So I'm going to unplug that, plug it in there, and I'm going to... The other thing you need to do is you need to connect. It's not quite... Like I said earlier, it was... No, come on. I'm going to close that. Uh, it's going to be a very boring remainder of the talk if it doesn't work, eh? Normally you hear the bing bong of a new device connecting, but it's not. Let's try this instead. Right, the demo gods are not happy. There we go, it's worked now. So you set your, your COM port up on the top there um, that you've connected to, so COM6. Um, you fast run out of COM ports, and you have to do a, a clean and reset. Um, so if we burn that to the board, you can see it's starting down here, it's enabling mono, um, disables it, restarts the meadow, and then starts loading all the codes onto the board um, to get this to work. And the problem is I've now unplugged my camera. Um, so you'll have to just trust the fact that the LED will start glowing in a wee while. As you can see here, you can see where it's loaded the, the Wi-Fi config and it puts that into the ESP32. And you can see it's all starting to download the, uh, the files. Um, and while that's running, and working, we will go across and look at the CLI. So in your, um, when you're installing all this, you go out to, um, you go out to, uh, where is it, extensions, manage extensions, and Meadow, and you install the tool in Visual Studio, which puts all the bits into Visual Studio to make it work with the Meadow system. And the other part you install is the CLI as well. So you can get, if you can spell Cliff, there you go. Um, so you can get all the, the bits that you need to use to control the board. Now, but the only thing you'd use here is uh, download OS and flash OS, which is a way of putting a new OS, that new Nutex part, and the Meadow Core onto the board. And so, If we do meta device info on, uh, it's not on COM6, what was it, it was on COM4, com I think it was, wasn't it? I think it was COM4. You can see here, the LED is flashing. Those at the back, just trust the fact it's working. Stop this to see the COM port. So it was COM6. There we go. So you can uh, do device info, and then you can see the fact that we've got a micro F7 and what processors we've got. It's Wi Fi MAC address if you're looking for it on the internet, and the firmware versions that have been installed as well. What we can also do is. What does that do? file list and what that does is goes out and looks at our a file list that's on there so you can see here we've got all the the at the top here we've got the actual app that we're loaded onto the board uh, the meadow foundation stuff and then we're starting to get into 
um, looking at the Microsoft extensions, the file providers, and, and the likes. And then further down here, we've got MS Core Lib, uh, we've got system.core, system.io, system.memory, .NET HTTP. These are all the normal libraries that we use. Yeah? So when we do our console app, this is what we use uh, in, our, in our projects. And they're all there. You can see the fact that the, the board we're using 10.74 meg. Um, so it's quite a, a big package, but we've got 64 on the new boards. Um, so you've got quite a bit of memory. And if you run out of that, you can plug in an SD card and it'll increase that space as well for you. And it does it magically so it becomes uh, usable space rather than just uh, space that's there. So that's a, a fairly simple project that we've loaded onto the board. You can see there we had the output and we had all the, um, the, the um, uh, debug.write lines we can go out to as well. So we're not doing printf statements like we used to do in our C and C++ days. Um, so now if we go out and look at a slightly, not that one, Project Labs board, this one here. So we looked at the, the, uh, the weather project earlier, just showed not plug it in because for some reason the cable is not fully working. Um, but we've got our Meadow app and we come in and we look at the fact that we're initializing the boards, we're setting up the hardware and uh, then we're setting up the main controller. And again, it's all using controller base because it's a great way to uh, architect your infrastructure. Um, and then we, we run that. So we go out to the controllers and we've got a display controller, which is setting up the display. This is the, the small TFT display that's on the, on the front of the board here. And, and then we set up that display screen and we can draw the Wi-Fi status, the sync status, which are all little icons on the screen, uh, et cetera. And then we got the REST client, which is literally, if I close that, um, we're going out to openweathermap.org, um, passing out a, uh, a, a, a key, uh, and then we're, you know, we've got an async task and HTTP client. So this is all normal.net that you're used to seeing and using in your projects. And we get the response and we deserialize that response. We do some value uh, translation just because the open API, um, the way it returns the data, you just want to convert it um, into a, something that fits and works on the screen. Um, and then we've got our catch blocks to catch any exceptions, which will then do the resets. Um, and you can see here returning null, which will then do that hard reset that we talked about earlier. Um, getting the weather icon. Um, so we, we got a big massive switch statement here that decides what the weather's doing. If it's a drizzle shower, then we go out to the weather constants. We look in the resources. There's um, a drizzle icon, which will get shown on screen. Um, so you can see what the weather looks like pictographically as well. Um, but we've got our data objects as well. So again, it's just a normal class. So. What I'm kind of hopefully putting across here is your normal C-sharp, F-sharp, or Visual Basic, if you're that one person, skills, you can write a program that runs on a small board that gets plugged into a battery and just needs Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or as I've used before, a 5G signal to connect to the cloud. And then you're suddenly off to the races with building whatever project you want to build. Um, and these are like 45 bucks, so they're not that expensive. Um, you know, shipped in. Um, so you can build your project, get it working, have it doing whatever your business needs to make your, uh, your project work. So we looked at um, uh, there and then we can see here we've got interfaces as well um, so we can get all that to work as well. So because it's not working fully I'm going to leave that alone and move away from that and hopefully the other one I've got is this one here, which is connecting to the cloud. On there. So all these other speakers have it easy. They don't have all this hardware that they need to make sure it works. And you know, the gremlins and the conference Wi-Fi, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, to panic and worry about. Um, where's my Bars. It's in there. Where's my? There it is. 
So we're on COM4 now. Let me connect this. So what this is here is um, some software that's going to talk AMQP. It's going to... Don't do that to me. Deploy failed. Why is that then? Let's try that again. Is it working now? There you go, it's connected to it now. Um, so this is going to talk AMQP. It's going to reach out to, uh, to Azure um, and it's going to connect to an IoT hub uh, with this, this board name and uh, it's going to take the, the location. I did do this talk uh, previously at NDC um, in Oslo and I had a GPS receiver plugged in but obviously then you're in a big building and the GPS didn't work so the talk failed. So what I do now, see I, I learned, um, what I do now is I just fake the GPS and then at the very bottom rather than me moving the GPS around. I really didn't think the, uh, the, um, the talk through about the GPS not actually moving that far. Um, so what I do now is, at the bottom here, is I just take the mock destination and then I just randomly pick a vector and move randomly 0 to 10 miles inside that vector and update the, the, the location every few seconds. So it's, the idea being is it's meant to look like a truck driving around London. Um, and you can see where the, uh, the truck is going and what it's doing. So that's what the uh, app is doing. Um, but we are doing the initialize again. We're setting up the onboard uh, uh, LED, which we can use for saying it's connected. So it's gone green, saying it's connected. And then we connect to uh, the Azure IoT Hub and we connect to the devices. We make a connection. And then what we do is we send in messages. Um, up to the cloud and if we go out here you can see it's just connected to the Wi-Fi so cloud messages start sending shortly and it sends a bunch of messages about 10 messages up to the cloud and then disconnects and uh, and goes offline again so that's kind of what this is doing but it proves the fact that you know all I've got here there's there's just the boards um, there's a couple of wires which work for the robot um, but there's nothing else on there um, so we've now got a, a, you know, a board that's sending data to the cloud quite simply and easily using normal bog standard NuGet of the AMQP and Azure IoT um, hub um, NuGet, which have been pulled down from the cloud as if I was on a PC running full Windows or I was on a Mac OS running full um, OS there. Um, so I've just pulled those down, installed them and got them working. There's nothing special about them at all. So if we go out to here, um, Conference Wi-Fi, come on, you've got an IP address, it should be working. It's decided not to. Um, while it's doing that, let's go out to um, Azure IoT Hub. So this is on my Azure space here. That's the name of the, um, the, the Nano Framework one when I do this talk using Nano Framework as well. And there's our Meadow F7. So we can click into that and um, you can see all the, the bits here. If you want to add a uh, device, you can click add a device, um, give it a name. Uh, I'm using symmetric keys just because I don't have to do cryptographic signing um, and it's easier. And then I can give it a name, auto-generate the keys and uh, I'm off to the races. Um, in the top of the code here, um, you do need a, you do need a, a, a SAS token here. The quickest and easiest way of getting one of these is using uh, VS Code. Add the, um, the Azure IoT Hub uh, plugin, and then you can connect um, to your Azure IoT Hub. If you right click on your device, sorry, you can generate a SAS token for that device, and it will do it all for you and do all the signing and everything else. Um, otherwise, you're down at the command line typing this heinously long uh, command in. I've seen some nodding heads, so people have been there and shared the pain. Um, the other way of doing this, obviously, is you can um, use uh, Azure Device Provisioning Service, uh, DPS, um, which you'll connect to the Device Provisioning Service, passing a token, um, and then Device Provisioning Service will say, I want you to connect to this IoT hub because I can see that you're connecting via this IP address. So you're in England or you're in America or you're in Germany or wherever you are in the world, connect to the local IoT hub, and this is the connection string to connect to that hub, and it will give that shared token back, which you can install in memory, cryptographically, and then every time you turn on, you'll connect to the IoT hub. That is if you're 
deploying thousands of devices. If you're only deploying two or three, we can just do it um, easy enough here. So as it started sending data, uh, you can see here it's starting sending data out. And if we go out to here and we should be able to start seeing. So you can see here it's sent a, a lat and long and it's creating a payload and sending it out. And it should pop up here. But it's not. All right, you just have to trust me in the fact that the messages are going. <laughs> and they're getting there. I have no idea what's going on here. Um, this all worked earlier. But I think... It's not getting there, is it? If we go out to the clouds and look here and go back to our devices... Um, we can look at the device twin. And this here is our device twin is basically the message center. So we can send message to the device as a cloud device message or back. You can see here um, when it was last connected. So it's not actually updated and connected. Uh, there we go. So last activity was this morning at 9.48. Um, so it has connected to the hub and it's been sending data, but I'm not able to get VS Code to, uh, to view it for some reason. Okay. Um, the other thing we can do is we can send messages to the device, we can send back the other way, so we can send a, a bit of a, a JSON packet back and then in our code here we have got a uh, on message, so when it receives a message um, and it's just basically a, a, a JSON packet. So you take out the, uh, the message, you take out the, the title of the message, um, the commands, and then the next, obviously, string value pairs. The value is what we're taking out. So I'd take out set lat and set long and update the lat and long. So I can move it from here, NDC London, to say NDC Oslo, NDC Porto, um, by just sending the cloud to device message um, back to the device and get it to work and connect. So hopefully you've seen the fact that what we've got is just normal .NET and uh, normal libraries, uh, normal dependencies, you know, and packages, etc., that are in inside our files. Um, sadly, I don't know why it didn't work. We have to work out on that. Um, so you go back to our slides, and I want to. That's now plugged into there. I'll take that from there. Plug it there. I think probably what it is is my little uh, my little hub has decided to die on me. There we go. So we go back and talk about. So I know what you're thinking. Yeah, great, that's, Cliff. That's that's awesome. And you've shown a board and you show me .NET running on a small board. But really, what I'm going to do with that? Yeah, what am I going to tell my boss when I go back? And I see this cool demo, but yeah, it was just demo where you know, the guy you know didn't get it, even get it to work properly. But I want to talk to you about some. Uh, some real world cases where meadows are being used in the field. Um, so the meadow team are working with a company called TFA Labs in the US and they're securing the US power grid. So pretty important, you know, if you're American, you kind of want the power to get there, otherwise your demo definitely won't work. Um, but what they've got is the US power grid is obviously made up of donkey's years old technology, you know, Modbus and, and the likes, really old tech. Um, but they want to monitor it, they want to um, check that it's working, check that the power grid is working. Um, and in doing so, they want to connect it to the internet. But if you connect it to the internet, then bad is going to hack it and turn off, you know, Boston or New York. Um, things are not going to be good. So what they've got is they've now got a meadow which connects the internet. And the meadow connects via Modbus to the, um, to the hardware in the, in the, um, in the fields. Uh, and all the power generation systems. So now they've got a secure way of updating these old devices that have been there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. They've got a secure way of talking to them and taking them. Yeah, maybe they do not have the ability to talk to the internet. They now have the ability to take those sensor readings. What is the temperature at that junction on the, uh, on the, on the, um, on the mains incomer there? Um, and just as the messages have now started arriving on my... Uh, Never mind. Um, no, so I'm impatient. 
Um, so they've got these, um, these meadow boards that are, are sitting there now and they're rolling them out across to protect the uh, US power network. So these are real world, uh, out, in the, uh, out, in the, um, out in the real world um, devices that are being used um, today um, and working with the US government. Clicker stopped working now. There you go. Um, another one, Julian Farms out in Portland, Oregon. Um, they're using it to monitor their chicken coops and uh, the animals around the farm. And what they've found is the fact that they can monitor the chicken coop for temperatures, noise, um, you know, how much the chickens are clucking. Um, if they're really upset, they cluck really loudly, therefore, are they missing food or water? Or are there too many in there? Is it too hot? Do we need to open some of the doors to cool them down? Etc. etc. And just in doing that, and monitoring the number of eggs that are produced, they've doubled their egg production. So how cool is that? Putting a bit of tech in the a, in a, in a field and it's now doubled your production. Uh, we'd all love to do that, wouldn't we, in our, in our um, work. Uh, and you know, monitoring the livestock and seeing where it is and you know, what parts of the fields they're, working, uh, they're, they're roaming around in for the cows, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but you know, this is, again, a real world example of what IoT can do. Feeding all that, that back to the clouds, um, plugging your Azure IoT hub in, um, and then a Power BI dashboard that looks at that and monitors it all. So, you know, the non techie people that are sitting in the back office can look at a chart in real time and see what's going on. Actually, it's getting really warm. Actually, it's getting really loud in the chicken coop. What's going on? Let's go and get the fox, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, projects uh, I've worked on, as I said earlier, is uh, in an office space, looking to see how many people are in the office. Do we need to turn the lights off because there's no one there? Um, there's only a few people, so let's turn the air conditioning flow rate down, save some electricity, so smart building stuff. Um, uh, hot desking, you know, we've got sensors, we did have cameras, um, but you know, they weren't liked by the females because obviously the cameras were pointing down and it could look down their cleavage, so we learned very quickly not to do that. So we replaced them with uh, sensors you see in car parks. Um, which is just basically heat sensors and they just look to see if there's a warm area underneath the camera and that solved the problem and everyone was happy. Um, so again, you know, we'll make mistakes, we'll build devices, but because it was easy to plug into with a different sensor, that's what we did. Um, and then we showed that on a big screen as you walk into the building to show well, on you know, the second floor, there's a bunch of desks at the back. I've got an important meeting, I need to be away from people. Or actually, it's really loud over there. I'm gonna go and sit with the fun people and have some fun today rather than actually do some work. Um, but, you know, uh, there's a mobile app that connects to it as well, so you can see all the dashboards and the, uh, the building management team can control the temperatures and set them um, such that, you know, the people can go and twiddle the dial on the wall they want to turn the temperature up, but really the control is all done uh, in the app. Um, but these are the sorts of things you can get to do um, with your uh, IoT devices. Um, all these boards are available from Meadow. Again, I don't work for Meadow. Um, I'm just you know, someone that likes using their tech and I think it's really cool. As a .NET developer, it's opened up what I can do with my .NET skills um, in the IoT space. Um, yes, I did you know, um, work as an engineer in the car industry for many years, so I do have that hardware engineering background, but it means that I don't need to lean on that as much now to get the IoT projects to work. Um, everything I've done, all the, um, the slides, all the, uh, the software that is there, if you want to uh, go out to my GitHub, it's at the top there, uh, you can download it and use it. It's all you know, free to take um, and hopefully for you it works, unlike today. Um, I think my hub has, uh, has died, which is what's caused everything to stop working. Um, that's for me. I've got a minute or two for questions if anyone's got any questions. If not, I'm around all day. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. Got a question down here. Uh, question was, what's hardware support like? Can I go out to Primaroni uh, or Amazon or somewhere and buy a device, uh, a sensor that will plug into? It will. Um, just like uh, you get a BME 280 or you get a, a GPS sensor, anything that works with any Adafruit, um, any of the uh, um, Arduino devices will work with Meadow. Um, because at the end of the day, it's just you know, a signal on off if it's digital or an analog signal, 4 to 20 milliamps, that sort of thing. So, yeah, any device that you can find out there will work. Um, as I said, the Meadow Foundation has got over 200 um, libraries now. That, that all the main devices that you can think of buying from the likes of Pimeroni, etc., have all been 
um, taken apart by the team and have written libraries and put them in the foundation. There's one that you want to use um, that isn't there. The, the team are active on Slack. They've got a Slack channel. You can go out there and say, look, I want to use this sensor. I can't quite find a, a library for it. Um, any chance you can help, and they will probably help you and write it for you. Because they want you to succeed. It's their business to make sure you buy more boards. So if you succeed and you buy a 1,000 boards to you know, build up your infrastructure, they're winning as well. So, any other questions? One down at the front here. Um, yeah, the mono runtime is taking care of all that for you, um, just like it would on, a, on, a, on an old Xamarin app um, and .NET MAUI uh, these days. So that's all done for you. Um, you haven't got a lot of memory there, so you're not going to build up a, a massive kind of stack of, uh, of data, which is going to have to be garbage collected. Um, and then you've got the, uh, the uh, micro RTOS there as well, which is coming in with interrupts. Um, so you can set up sensors that are uh, not driven by the code, but are driven by interrupt as well. Um, so if you have something that is time critical comes in, you can interrupt the fire your program and call a direct method uh, within your code. Um, it's all out on the, on, the, on the docs, so you can do all that as well. Um, the docs are really good. Um, you know, highly recommend you get a device and, and, and take it for a spin. Um, but that is managed for you. Um, obviously, you can do the GC Collect if you want to. Um, it's .NET. Do what you want to do, and you're used to doing. Um, I just find you tend not to need to do it. So uh, my time's up. I'm around, so I'm going to be trying to unplug things and not let you keep myself. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for coming and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.